Good morning, everybody. This is another edition of the Passball Show brought to you by JohnPLA.com, by St. Aloysius Church and School in Jackson, New Jersey, also by Two Ways, One Passion Food Truck located in Scranton, Pennsylvania. A handful of stuff we're going to get into today. As always, in the world of baseball, sports, and unifying America. And you, know, you think about this weekend, and obviously, from a football fan perspective, it's something to be excited about. You got probably the best weekend of football that you're going to see throughout the entire season. And you got four big games, obviously two today, two tomorrow. Um, outside of that, there's just a handful of takes that we can jump in and talk about if you want to. There's, of course, the Kendrick Perkins, Kevin Durant thing, which I don't think is that big of a deal, but it does bring out or expose Kevin Durant for having those so-called rabbit ears. What you really think about a Major League Baseball umpire that can't hear a comment from a crowd or a dugout without having to take his mask off and go over there and confront that person. And I do think that it's a, a sign of a weak mind. And, you, you know, in order to have a strong mind, you have to take a certain share of criticism not necessarily all the time, not necessarily be soft and you know weak when it comes to it, but at the same time, you can't respond to every single thing that's put out there against you. And Kevin Durant seems to do that. He seems to take the Twitter, uh, arguing with fans. I mean, listen, dude, anybody that was in Kevin Durant's shoes would understand the difference between somebody that's in his prestige and what he has earned and his level of celebrity against some random person from some random state who may be unemployed but is basically sending a message to him from his couch with no background, with no expertise about basketball or life or anything. He's just some average anybody. And when you, you allow people like that to impact your lives, especially when you are the celebrity that Kevin Durant is, it just looks very weak for you. Um, you're thinking about baseball and you, to what could happen with the Houston Astros. And Bob Nightingale is reporting. And you know, Bob Nightingale's a, a nice guy. He also has the tendency to report stuff that doesn't end up happening. And I know he goes, he, he does his research, he does everything he, he needs to do to break a story or try to break a story. But sometimes those stories don't end up being true. But he, he apparently is ahead of this Houston Astros cheating scandal. And apparently Major League Baseball is going to invoke some of the harshest penalties that they ever have against an organization in the history of the sport. And somebody may ask me, what do I feel about that? And once again, it comes to the difference between cheating and gamesmanship. What rules were broken? Because anybody in competitive sports, let alone just baseball, is looking for an advantage. And you see it keep happening. I mean, I, I looked at the, the video clip, I think it was the anniversary of the Dwight Clark catch. And he goes out there and he makes that catch, but you know he's got stick him on his hands. Now, it's one of the best catches in football history. It's a moment that's never going to be forgotten. But if you want to, if you want to take the cheating aspect at it and say, hey, he had a competitive advantage that the other players that were playing didn't have. You could probably say that if you want. And the other thing that I wanted to talk about, you, you think about the catchers in baseball and all the sabermetricians, all the people that study fan graphs and, you know, defense. Oh, my God, defense is going to be the new offense in baseball. And you're going to talk about all the best defensive players and forget about offense. But hey, I'm going to save my rant about that for another day. Catchers framing. You're talking about catchers, first of all, stealing strikes, which, by the way, the word stealing is not good, right? If you're taking something from somebody or if you are disobeying uh, the, you know, the rules of the game, if you're fooling the umpire into thinking that a ball is really a strike, is that cheating? But you want to talk about cheating as it applies to steroids. You want to talk about cheating as it applies to, 
knowing what kind of signs the opponent is going to have out there. And listen, there's varying degrees of it. And I'm not going to deny that there's no cheating aspect involved in it, but we're talking about a sport that has been brought up on gamesmanship, has been brought up on deviousness, and in all seriousness, is not the cookie-cutter, friggin' flower-handing game that most of the fans make it out to be. There's deception involved. There's people that are trying to do everything they can to win. When a catcher steals a strike, that is a form of cheating. But it's a, cheating, a form of cheating that's okay from the modern-day baseball fan because you convince the umpire, hey, the umpire's got to do a better job. Well, I'll tell you this. In a couple of years, when you got a robotic strike zone, it ain't going to matter how good a framer a catcher is. And we can talk about how great Austin Hedges or Travis Darno can frame a pitch. Those guys might be out of baseball by the time there's robotic umpires. They better hit a little better. Better contribute in other aspects of the game instead of quote unquote stealing strikes. What I really wanted to start off the show talking about, you hear about this guy, and obviously he's gonna have his 15 minutes of fame. He's a guy that, if he didn't decide to do what he's doing with this lawsuit that he's filing against the New York Yankees, nobody would ever know what his name is. And anybody that wants to get to the story, you probably say, hey, I've, I've glanced upon it. I've heard about what happened and probably won't remember the name of the player. You probably got to look up the story to figure out the name of the player. And once again, we're starting a show talking about, uh, you know, sour takes, you know, Kevin Durant, you know, having a hard time with fans on Twitter. And I guess my question that I would ever ask if I had, uh, what's the, what's the guy's name? Garrison Lassiter. He was a former, Draft pick of the New York Yankees, played in the New York Yankees farm system. And by, I think, his third year of playing minor league baseball, he was done. The Yankees let him go. Now, eight years have gone by since he had his, uh, his, his moment, his opportunity. And listen, you think of the, the hundreds and hundreds and even thousands of players that get opportunity to play professional baseball. And, you know, the best message I could send out to Garrison Lasseter is that the odds, once you enter professional baseball, are still not very good that you're going to make the major leagues. You know, it's understood that the top draft picks and players that teams invested more in, in regards to slot money, in regards to bonuses, signing bonuses and stuff like that, that those teams are going to take care of their investments a little bit better. Now, Garrison Lasseter was drafted in the 27th round of the 2008 draft by the New York Yankees. And his odds as a 27th round pick to make the major leagues, unfortunately, were not very good. And it's no disrespect meant to Garrison Lasseter. He's, you know, he might be the best player that ever got into, you know, the 27th round of a draft. But if you look at some of the other players, and I'm pulling this up right now, to look at anybody that played in the major leagues that was drafted in the 27th round of the 2008 draft. There's a person by the name of Eli Villanueva who had a brief cup of coffee, one game, he was drafted by the Marlins in that round. Um, there's a, a pitcher for the Brewers by the name of Austin, I'm sorry, a shortstop by the name of Austin Adams. Ended up playing briefly in the major leagues, drafted by the Milwaukee Brewers. Sonny Gray, Anthony Rendon, and the reason their names are out there is because they were both drafted out of high school. And they ended up not signing. They came back in the later drafts, were drafted higher. Obviously, Anthony Rendon was a, a top, what, six or seven pick in all of Major League Baseball when he was in college. So the, the, those players really don't count. Ryan Cook, Hunter Savenka. So then we try to look at this guy, Garrison Lasseter. Overall, the 830th pick of the 2008 Major League Baseball draft. And he was a shortstop. 
probably not the first shortstop that was ever uh, drafted after Derek Jeter. And, you know, Jeter was taken very high in the draft overall, um, probably because George Steinbrenner was out of baseball, but also because the Yankees sucked at that time. The Yankees were really bad because of that. They had a couple bad years. They got some high draft picks and were able to take this guy by the name of Derek Jeter, who ends up becoming one of the best players in the history of that franchise. And we think of Derek Jeter now because the Hall of Fame vote is going to come out next week or the week after. And we're going to know that Derek Jeter is officially going to be part of baseball's Hall of Fame. Now, will Larry Walker join him? Will Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens inch a little bit closer? That'll be for another discussion that we have before that announcement. So Derek Jeter's playing, you know, year 2008 through 2012. And maybe at some point you're thinking Derek Jeter's not going to play forever. And this guy, Garrison Lasseter, is struggling in the minor leagues. And it's not like he's going out there hitting 30 home runs. It's not like he's hitting 340. He plays, you know, in rookie ball, South Atlantic League, back with the Gulf Coast Yankees, South Atlantic League, New York Penn League. So he finally, in what is his fifth season of professional baseball, moves up to high A Tampa and can't cut it there. He's not even hitting 200. So the Yankees, who, understandably, because they selected him in the 27th round of the draft, we're not going to have a ridiculous leash from this guy. And what Garrison Lasseter may not understand is that hundreds of players, hundreds of talented players, hundreds of very good baseball players that could, in a right situation, be major leaguers, end up having their dreams lost. Every single offseason, every single spring training, over the course of every single regular season, drafts come. Every single time a group of players are drafted, that kind of exacerbates or the shelf life of the players that are at certain levels. All right, is this player ready to move to the next level? How are they doing in the level that they are? And I'm sure in the year of 2012, when Garrison Lasseter was playing for Class A Tampa in you know, high A in the Florida State League, there was a little bit of a nudge from players that were drafted in years later to see, hey, can they play shortstop? Can they play third base? And Garrison Lasseter's not hitting 200 in high A in his fifth year of professional baseball. I'm sorry, he had a legitimate opportunity. Now, he goes out there in this lawsuit that he wants to file against the New York Yankees. And I, I look at it and I say, hey, it's his... 15 minutes of fame. It's his opportunity right now to have a name for himself because he didn't make it in Major League Baseball. And maybe in his own mind, he's the most naive player that we've ever seen in baseball. Maybe he believes that he is so much better than he really is. Or maybe he really is that talented and for some reason just never got another chance. Gets released by the Yankees in 2012. And the first thing that I got to say to criticize this guy is, where was that other team that signed you? If you were so good, uh, I'm sure the worst of all baseball teams would, would say, hey, let me sign this guy, place him somewhere in my minor leagues, and maybe I'll get the most out of him. There's independent baseball, and I give so much credit to these younger players that when things aren't going good, when they get cut by their major league team that they were drafted by or signed with, and they go out there and they love to play baseball. So they play independent ball. They go overseas. They do everything they can to get themselves showcased. If they are as good as they believe they are, they're at least going to see it through. This guy didn't do that. This guy is basically the example of that Me Too athlete, this generation now person that just feels like things should be handed to him. What did he do to deserve his spot? on that Tampa Yankees roster in 2012. And I understand he had 82 at-bats, but what did he do the year before that? He had a home run in 274 in low A Charleston in the South Atlantic League, which, by the way, is his fourth professional season. He's got to show some promise at some point. Now, could he have been demoted? Maybe, but I'm sure the Yankees were like, hey, listen, this is the guy's fifth year. How many players had they signed and drafted after that that have passed him already. Baseball's a tough business. 
That's why we respect the just under 20,000 in the history of the world, not just this country. They've had a chance to say that they're Major League Baseball players for one game. And what does this guy want? A participation trophy? He played professional baseball. He had a chance. It didn't work out. But what pisses me off about this guy just deciding he's going to file a lawsuit and have his 15 minutes in the sun so people know who he is, know his name, is the fact that he didn't just like you say, hey, somebody that's in college that's pissed off because they don't get a chance to be a doctor, did they do everything they can to further their education? <clears throat> did they finish school? Did they go to further education? This guy didn't do anything to try to play any sort of professional baseball. And I promise you, he wasn't shut out. The Yankees didn't send out a memo and have this guy blackballed and say, don't sign him. If he was that good, if there was enough promise in him at age 22, which the guy's 30 now, I'm sure some team would have taken a chance on him. Some team would have thrown him on a, on a bench in some certain level and say, hey, maybe minor league spring training next year will try to find you a place to play. Go overseas. Play winter ball. Independent baseball. This guy stops playing at age 22 and then files in this lawsuit says Derek Jeter, because the Yankees love Derek Jeter so much, he didn't get much of an opportunity. He didn't get an opportunity because he wasn't good enough. And maybe he had more to offer than he showed, but on the baseball field, he didn't show enough to warrant his continuing to be a member of the New York Yankees. And like I said, if he was that good, how come nobody else picked him up? If he was that good, how come he wasn't playing overseas? If he was that good, how come no independent league team picked him up? This copyright broadcast is authorized under internet rights granted by the World Wide Web and solely for entertainment of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, or the use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this show without the express written consent of the Passball Show, JohnPLA.com. And John P. L. E. L. L. C. is prohibited. Any commercial that eats the program, such by charge and admission for its showing, is similarly prohibited. So as I continue to flap my yap mouth, trying to redefine sports broadcasting and talk radio as we know it, you can think about the NFL playoffs that are happening this weekend. You can think about the NBA teams. You can talk about... Anthony Davis's injury, how does that impact the Lakers? Is there any chance that the Lakers are going to be bounced from that number one seed in a Western Conference? Because if they things hold true and they end up being the number one seed, they'll play a team probably with a losing record. We spoke about that a couple weeks ago, the top heaviness of the National Basketball Association, not just in the Eastern Conference, excuse me, like we've seen over the last couple of years, but in a Western Conference as well. So if you go land a top seed or even a top two seed in one of the two conferences, you're going to have a pretty much a cakewalk, maybe the equivalent of a first round bye. So I think it's important for the Lakers to stay healthy because you want to make sure when you're in the playoffs, you got a healthy LeBron, you know, no signs of a groin injury by playoff time. Anthony Davis, anything that he's dealing with, you want to make sure is gone and by the wayside by the time playoffs come. You don't want to risk it. You don't want to have these guys busting their ass every single game playing hurt with the risk of further injury just to try to win a couple extra games. Because if you win those couple extra games and one of those players are not available for the playoffs and miss significant time, then it's all done and not. So I was thinking about as we're getting ready for the division round of the National Football League playoffs. What is the biggest story of this weekend? Because, you know, one of the things that really is a pattern is what you hear about is the first weekend of the National Football League playoffs, and you think of the teams that ended up winning, whether it was Tennessee beating New England, the Saints losing a tough game, of course, to the Minnesota Vikings. And we start to give a lot of credit to these teams that won in wildcard weekends. And as we 
play odds. You start to see the numbers kind of bounce up a little bit. And you find that the teams that are playing at home, the teams with the first round by, are considerable favorites across the board. And the lowest line is Green Bay four and a half at home against Seattle. Now, there's a reason these teams get first round buys. And there's also a reason why the majority of these teams with the first round buys end up making it into the conference championship games. So a lot of what we saw last weekend, we may have to try to forget a little bit. But we try to think of these teams that won last Saturday, last Sunday, and doing what they did. And there's always the feeling that maybe we feel they're a little bit better than they are. And what I'm going to do is I'm picking my weekend games. I'm looking at the point spreads. And, and I'm almost ready to take the plunge and take the L because I really feel in the end that these teams with the higher seeds, with the first round buys, are going to have a little easier time than I'm giving them credit for. We're talking about the national championship game, LSU-Clemson on Monday, which if you have followed the bowl championship series, the first two games that were played, obviously a highly contested game, between Clemson and Ohio State, LSU having their way with Oklahoma, but they certainly were a superior team. And you think about LSU as they're playing Clemson. LSU looked way more dominant, certainly against an inferior team, and Clemson's going to have their hands full with Joe Burrow, with all those receivers, and LSU defense that doesn't get enough credit but is pretty good. And then you wonder, Clemson, Chance to win their third national championship in, what, five or six years. Dabo Sweeney, the whole thing, that would be great. And then you think of oh, this LSU Tiger team, and they, they really are the best team in college football. And it probably would be considered an upset if they somehow lost this game. Is the draw to this national championship game what it's been over the last couple of years? You think of Alabama, Clemson. You think of some of the other matchups in a national championship game. This one seems like you got one team that is the best team in the sport and a team in Clemson that may be the second best team in the sport but really doesn't belong on the same field as LSU. And obviously if Clemson wins, I'll be eating my words, but to me that's an easy bet. If you bet LSU with a six and a half that they're getting, yeah, money line may not win you as much. You hope that, uh, you know, maybe some people start betting on Clemson and the line creeps closer to five or four, but I don't I don't think it's going to happen. And, you know, usually one of the things you see, the favorites, a lot of people will start banking on the favorites as we get closer to the game. Same thing with, you know, the pro football playoffs. Teams are going to start betting on the favorites up until the, the, the playing, you know, the, the time of the game. But I just thought it was interesting to just think about the spreads. Obviously, they're going to go a little higher. And me as a betting man, I feel like I am drawn to want to take some of the underdogs. Minnesota plus seven. Tennessee plus nine and a half. Seattle plus four and a half. What a lot of people can say, hey, maybe Seattle can beat Green Bay straight up. But would you be surprised if Tennessee-Baltimore wasn't a close game? Especially with the weather conditions tonight. You know, it's going to be lousy weather. There's going to be a lot of running into football. Maybe a game that if I'm going to bet it over-under, I'd probably bet on the under. Maybe not a ridiculously high-scoring game. Low-scoring games certainly benefit the team that is the underdog, at least being able to you know keep it within the points. Minnesota. San Francisco, and I know everybody loves San Francisco. It's all you hear about it. You know, Jimmy G, the 49ers defense, the darlings of the National Football League. You know, they have to go out there and prove something. And if they beat the Vikings, if they beat the Vikings decisively, I think I will start to give them credit as being a legitimate Super Bowl contender. I don't believe they've earned that yet. They kind of came out of the woodwork. I know they've played well. Their defense is strong. They got some... Things clicking on offense with Jimmy G, the running back, the tight end. They got some good players there. 
But if you tell me that this is a Super Bowl team, I'm still not feeling it. I think there's enough teams that could beat San Francisco on a neutral field. And I think there's teams out there that could go to San Francisco and beat them, including the Minnesota Vikings. But once again, you got the narrative that's out there that the home team, the teams with the first round bye in the National Football League have a little bit of an advantage. And they seem to year after year because what did we just get done watching? We didn't watch the 49ers play last week. We didn't watch the Baltimore Ravens play last week. We didn't watch the Houston Texans or, I'm sorry, the Kansas City Chiefs or the Green Bay Packers play last week. We watched these other teams play. We watched Seattle and Houston and Tennessee and Minnesota. We watched them play good football and win games against competitive teams. So it's just natural that we believe in these teams and that they can go out there and win. But once again, you go back to last year, you go back to the year before, and you see a lot of these team seasons end this weekend. We'll see if it'll be any different. This is the famous Budweiser beer. We know of no brand produced by any other brewer that costs so much to brew and age. Our exclusive beach when aging produces a taste, smoothness, and drinkability you'll find in no beer at any cost. You got people that are criticizing the New York Mets for inviting Tim Tebow to spring training. And Tim Tebow obviously is a guy that's still playing professional baseball because his name is Tim Tebow. And you can't, you can't deny that. You know, even the most powerful Tim Tebow apologist will understand that he's getting a little more of an opportunity because he's Tim Tebow. Because he is that great University of Florida quarterback that played in the National Football League is obviously known as a celebrity and maybe getting a little bit of preferential treatment because of his name. He's going to be 32 this year. So he's been in the minor leagues with the New York Mets since 2017. This will be his fourth full season, played a little Arizona Fall League. And, and I think over time he wants to see it through. It's not like he's performed horribly. He is coming off of a very bad year at AAA Syracuse. And that's where the knocks are going to come in. They're going to say, why is this guy getting a chance to go to a major league spring training camp, maybe holding a seat for somebody else that may be a little more deserving? And I think this probably will be the last year that we see of Tim Tebow. Now, maybe, you know, from a body standpoint, from a workout standpoint, putting the time and the hours you talk about the 1,000 hours or the 10,000 hours that you have to continuously do something to become an expert at it. Maybe it starts to add up. Maybe Tim Tebow gets a little bit closer to being a Major League Baseball player. But as of right now, it's not looking very good. And the reason it's not looking very good is that he has really been unable to distinguish himself in any level of the minor leagues. Starting out in Columbia and Port St. Lucie where he was about a 230, 220 hitter. A little bit of power, but not enough power. Kind of, you know, some punch and judy power. power. Maybe that 8 to 12 home run a season power if he played all year. Went to Binghamton where he, he showed a little promise. Power didn't necessarily go up, but he held a good batting average. Uh, he was slightly above average in double A, but remember he was 30 years old playing against players that were, what, 24, 25, 23. So he moves up to Syracuse, and he seems like, or seemed like up until he got hurt last year, that he was overmatched. Now, he gets, it looks like he'll get a second opportunity or second chance to play in AAA baseball this year. And I think that's very important to him. But I think he's got to be smart enough to say, hey, if I, or if this player is not hitting it, not doing the things that you expect for somebody that is in their fifth year of professional baseball, this may be the end for Tim Tebow. And this is, this is the reason why I'm in favor of Tebow getting a chance to come to Major League Spring Training. Because I think 
if he doesn't distinguish himself this year, if he doesn't show himself to at least be on the peripheries of becoming a Major League Baseball player this year, I don't think he's going to be back next year. He's not going to get a token appearance in Major League Spring Training if he's not considered to be a Major League player. So he had the injury last year, of course, a, a rough season in AAA, maybe with a second chance to play in AAA, he shows a little bit more. And listen, you know he's trying, you know he's going to give everything he's got, you know he's, he's getting stronger, he's getting a little more fundamentally sound. We'll find out. Do I think that he's taking a, a spot in spring training for somebody that should be playing? You got to let me know about the list of non-roster invitees for the New York Mets. You got to let me know about the minor league players that should be getting more of a taste of big league spring training. Because the Mets as a farm system are very young. They have a lot of very young players and a lot of your top prospects are in the lower parts of the minor leagues. Which means that their spring training is going to consist of playing against other minor league teams. So we'll see. Maybe Brody Van Wagenen goes out there on a minor league free agent signing spree and you know, maybe the AAA roster there's not enough room for Tim Tebow. Maybe he's got to earn himself a spot on the AAA roster, which would, would be pretty good. How about you tell Tim Tebow, with all due respect to you, with all due respect to everything you're known for and everything you've accomplished and everything that you're going to be for the entirety of your life, that you got to go out there and earn a spot on the AAA Syracuse roster. And maybe if he doesn't, maybe he'll be released. Remember, Brody Van Wagenen didn't sign Tim Tebow. Sandy Alderson did. A little bit of a recap of the show today. It was talking, basically throwing some odds and ends out there. You, know, you got you know Kevin Durant and Kendrick Perkins. You, know, you got people that want to make the story out and be a little bit more than it is. We know that Kevin Durant has rabbit ears. He's that guy that has those antennas up all the time. Ears perk up every time somebody tweets something at him. You know, that guy that's living in his basement with his parents, it, you know, knows nothing about sports, could tweet at Kevin Durant and get a response. And, you know, that just shows that you pay a little too much attention as a person that's an athlete, but a celebrity athlete on top of it. Somebody else has got to get in his corner. Somebody has to start talking to Kevin Durant and say, listen, if you are so triggered by things that are said in social media, maybe you should stay away from social media. Because these people mean nothing to you. These people are only making you look bad when you're stooping to the level of John Q. Twitter handle. And anybody that's making it out to be any more than just Kevin Durant having a problem with anybody saying anything about him. Like I said, it's not other basketball players saying anything about Kevin Durant in some cases. It's just random fans. And as a celebrity and as an athlete, you should be able to tell the difference and know which people to kind of stay away from and not respond to. We talked about this guy in the New York Yankees organization. He's trying to sue the Yankees. He believes that for whatever reason, he was denied the opportunity. Derek Jeter having a chance basically to finish his career with the New York Yankees. And I wouldn't have expected it to be any other way blocked him or kept him from having the opportunity to succeed. And it's not like he was moving through the New York Yankees system anyway. It sounds like uh, sour grapes. This sounds like somebody that is just bitter. Maybe in their own mind they were naive and thought they were this great baseball player, but when it came out there to actually play and be that great baseball player that this man believed that he was, it just didn't happen. And what do I have to say to that? I think there's a lot of people that are competing for different things in all wakes and fashions of life. And I think it's important that people don't ever lose their drive. Don't ever lose your passion to want to do what you want to do. And understand at some point there may have to be a different avenue for you to pursue whatever goals that you end up having. And what bothers me about Garrison Lasseter, once again, 
well, nobody would even know his name if he didn't file this lawsuit and make the outrageous claims that he made against the New York Yankees. What bothers me the most about this guy is that after the Yankees released him, he stopped playing baseball. He didn't latch on with another team. Maybe he tried. Maybe another team wouldn't pick him up. But he didn't play independent baseball. He didn't try for a contract overseas. He didn't play a winter ball. At the age of 22, his professional baseball career was over. Eight years have gone by. He is now 30. And he believes that he's entitled to anything from the New York Yankees. He was a 27th round draft pick. Yankees didn't invest a lot in him. And pretty similar to a lot of 27th round picks. He didn't accomplish his dreams and his goals. And what bothers me the most is that he didn't continue playing baseball. Now, if he continued, if he was still playing at the age of 30, or maybe he latched down with some other team, or maybe he's had some success in Korea, or Japan, or, or out in Cuba somewhere, or in the Mexican League, you could say that this guy's argument holds a little more water. It doesn't. When you get into the NFL picks, which I'll do right now, uh, Minnesota plus seven at San Francisco. I can see the 49ers winning a close game here. I can. I think they're going to be able to control the ball. I like what we saw out of Minnesota last week, but I, once again, like I said earlier, I don't want to take too much stock into what we saw last week. I think the Vikings will keep it close. I can see the 49ers winning the game late. You got the night game, Tennessee and Baltimore, and I'm taking Tennessee with the points for this reason. I felt last week that they could have beaten the Patriots outright, and they did. If you ask me that same question right now, I don't believe that they can beat the Baltimore Ravens outright. But the conditions in Baltimore are not going to be good today. It's going to be very cold. It's going to be very windy. And I could see the game being a run happy game. Derrick Henry, best running back in football this year. Is, seems to be getting better as the seasons go on. He had a 180-yard performance against New England last week. If they can establish the run, it's going to be a tight game. I can see Baltimore pulling it off. I can see them even winning by a touchdown. But if they do, Tennessee wins based off the points. So give me Tennessee plus 9.5 at Baltimore. But similar to Minnesota, I think San Francisco is going to win, and I think Baltimore is going to win. I just don't think they're going to cover the spread. So the Sunday games, I think they're going to be a little more interesting. Kansas City, Houston. I can see Patrick Mahomes going out there and having that vintage performance. At Arrowhead in front of the fans. Andy Reid as the head coach there. All of a sudden you start thinking about the Kansas City Chiefs and like, hey, is it going to be the time that Andy Reid goes out there and wins that Super Bowl? I know Deshaun Watson is going to, you know, it's going to be quarterback versus quarterback, mano y mano kind of thing. And obviously, there was a great game earlier in the season between the two quarterbacks and the two teams. But I think this is going to be a coming out party for Kansas City. No more New England. There's a, a path to the Super Bowl for a team in the AFC, in the American Football Conference, that is not from New England, not from Boston, not from Massachusetts. And I think the Chiefs are embracing this moment, embracing their opportunity to be that team that can go out there and get to the Super Bowl. And I think the Chiefs will cover. So give me Kansas City minus nine and a half in the only blowout game that we're going to see this weekend. Finally, Seattle, Green Bay. And you think about the back and forth that it could be there. I like Green Bay for this reason. They get the extra week off. They get the chance to prepare. Um, I look at Seattle and I say... They could keep it to a score, you know, a score or two game. But I could actually see Green Bay pulling away a little bit. Winning a game, let's say, 28 to 18 or 20 to 10 or 24 to 17, which is all within the confines of the spread. So give me Green Bay minus four and a half at home against Seattle. So I'm taking Minnesota and Tennessee with the points, and then I'm taking Kansas City and Green Bay to cover on Sunday. This is the Past Ball Show brought to you by JohnPielli.com, by St. Aloysius Church and School in Jackson, New Jersey, by Two A's, one passionate food truck located 
in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Of course, uh, if you didn't hear me before, I believe LSU is going to have no problem beating Clemson. I don't know if it's going to be as much of a blowout as the Oklahoma game. It certainly won't be. It'll be a little more competitive. Clemson is a better football team than Oklahoma. But I think this is LSU's year. So we'll see. Next time we go on the air, it'll be next Thursday for another edition of the Passball Show. We'll, we'll see if I'm right. Uh, we'll be back with you next week. God bless you. And as always, I'll see you on the other side.